Hi, Greg. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for uh, joining us from Hong Kong. My pleasure. Where you are uh, based. You work in the private sector there. But you are also known as a blogger at Belgravia Dispatch. You were a very active blogger during um, the Iraq War, and you, you blogged a lot on the torture issue. Uh, you, your blog has uh, been, I would say, inconsistent in its output since then. But uh, the, the Ukraine issue has clearly gotten your attention. I noticed that both because you've done some blog posts on that, but also um, on Twitter. You've been sure. very active on that front. Um, and I think, you know, this weekend, uh, seems like a very significant moment in that to me, it seems like it could well be remembered as the, the kind of the several days when things got spun out of control. Uh, you know, we, we've had this, uh, we should say we're taping this Sunday morning. It'll probably be posted uh, later Sunday and things are so fluid that things could happen between now and when this is posted. Yeah. But we've already had, you know, the, the deaths are starting to mount. We had this incident in Odessa, which is not even in eastern Ukraine proper, but more in southern Ukraine, where a bunch of pro-Russian activists, uh, there was a clash with pro-Ukrainian activists. The pro-Russians retreated to a building which was set on fire. 30 or something died. So things seem pretty tense to me. How do you read this moment? Well, I mean, I think... Um... You know, I think one of the issues we've had fundamentally with our policy towards Ukraine is that we haven't really thought through the, the implications of, of, of our short term policy decisions. And I think one of the one of the major issues we've had really in terms of our, our foreign policy generally is I don't think we try often enough to think about how our opponent sees the situation and fully understanding our opponent's position and, and our opponent's worldview. And I think. Um, you know, the, the recent agreement in Geneva that Kerry and Lavrov, uh, you know, agreed, there was really no content to it because it was so ambiguous. It wasn't even, you know, what, what I think Kissinger at one point called, you know, constructive ambiguity, where both sides can kind of, you know, read certain aspects into it and then use that to kind of leverage and make progress on such type of negotiation. It was really just clearly Putin and Lavrov, Putin was instructing Lavrov to have language that was basically saying, look, disarm right sector, disarm the people in, you know, the Maidan and Kiev and, and those types of radicals as they see them, empty those buildings out. Mm. And then we were saying, you know, obviously we were thinking about the Donbass and all the Eastern U U Ukraine area. And so I think there's just such a, there's such a, a delta or a, 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 a gulf mm. uh, between the two sides and how they're understanding the crisis. And I think that's one of the, the reasons that we're in such a dangerous position uh, where we sit tonight and, and your morning. Yeah. The, the other weird feature of that agreement was, um, you know, we talked about whether uh, Russia will abide by the agreement. But although I didn't read every I didn't read the agreement per se, my sense is Russia didn't actually agree to do anything. Russia's claim was that it didn't control the people who were occupying the buildings. So any agreement that calls for buildings to be vacated is not an agreement by Russia to do anything because by Russia's account, it's not the one occupying the buildings, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. But I think, look, whatever, however duplicitous we think Russian diplomats may be and Putin personally may be, I think at the end of the day, he's capable of being a serious strategist. He's, a, he's capable of being a serious negotiator. And I think if, if what we were doing was instead of our constant cheerleading of, of, of Kiev. And, you know, again, I, you know, I think of the imagery of Victoria Newland handing out the, the cookies in Maidan and here we are many months later and, and blood's being spilled and we're, we're in a very uh, potentially tragic situation already. What happened in Odessa is very tragic. And so I think that if we were treating Putin as more of an adult, and I know people are skeptical and they say he's, he's got his own, you know, he's, he's, he's very Machiavellian. He has his own agenda. He's not going to be a real honest bona fide counterparty, but I think we have to treat him with more respect in terms of his strategic objectives and aims. Uh, and by and 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 through that, uh, potentially we could we could make more progress, even if he had built in technical outs into the Geneva document from his vantage point. Right. If and that makes I, any sense. I mean, I I guess, I mean, it seems to me you have to treat people with respect, at least in the minimal sense of acknowledging how much power they have in a given situation. Right? I mean, it's a practical matter. This is something he's willing to fight for. We're not. He has shown he has shown in Georgia that he's willing to play hardball. Um, so you just it, it seems to me whenever you do a deal with anybody, 
you have to acknowledge the relative leverage that the two of you possess. And I, it's not clear to me that the United States is doing that. I mean, it, it, it's as if they still expect him to get out of Crimea or something. I, I, it's not clear to me what I, I have not. I'm not aware of like, uh, uh, you know, what, what is the administration's objective at this point? What, what realistic objective that Putin could live with, assuming he does have a certain amount of control here, um, is, is the administration even even looking for at this point? It's not clear to me. Well, I think I think potentially they're deluded enough to think, look, first, we want him to basically they're the so-called little green men. Uh, the theory is that they're fully under the control of of, 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 the, of the Russians and Putin. There was a good I think his name is C.J. Chivers. There was a good piece in today's New York Times, yeah. which points to some yeah. of the ambiguities and the local aspects. And you know, at the end of the day, Ukraine and Russia's history is so incredibly intertwined, especially in the southeastern portions of that country where their family and other links and. Um, you know, there, there, there can be local separatists that have genuine motivations that have sprung up naturally from the terrain that are not being completely directed uh, by, by Russians. But, but to get back to your question, I think what, what, what Washington is naively expecting is basically all of this separate activity is, is supposedly controlled by the Russians. They want Putin to back down, pull out the so-called little green man or, 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 or take, ratchet down the temperature with respect to the, the separatists, empty out of all these government buildings in Donetsk and Luhansk and the Donbass and generally. And then once that's accomplished, I think some probably are even more deluded and think that somehow down the road, once things cool down, we can open up another dialogue and try to have him reverse his decision to annex Crimea. And I view that as a, as a fait accompli. I mean, when you read his speech that he gave after the um, after, you know, be before the, the Duma had officially, you know, had officially legislated the, the full takeover, but when it was basically accomplished, um, it's very clear that from his vantage point, this is a, is a permanent act. So we have to pivot to kind of the going forward situation, not looking backwards. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I mentioned that one of the levers he has is he's willing to fight for it. We're not, but there's the other factor you alluded to in mentioning this New York times piece, which was very good, which is that, there's a considerable amount of indigenous support for Putin in the area we're talking about. And, and that's why it isn't just a question of NATO not be willing, being willing to fight for it. Kiev cannot, you know, does not really have the capacity to, to readily combat uh, the, the, the forces on the other side in eastern Ukraine, precisely because there is so much authentically indigenous support for this. I mean, that was clear in this New York Times piece about this one brigade in the pro-Russian forces that, you know, there may be various forms of Russian influence on this. And I'm sure Russia would like to have as much as possible. But there is clearly uh, indigenous support. I mean, all you have to do is look at it, look at a, you know, a basic demographic map to have known that. And, you know, very little of the American commentary uh, even kind of is clear on that, it seems to me. You know, if you look at the kind of stuff you see in the, in the, you know, Nick Kristoff, Tom Friedman, you know, commentary, um, it, it's, it's as if they just don't understand the actual demographics on the ground. Well, I mean, to me, it's another, uh, and I think we have to go back and look at this in slightly greater historical context. And it's almost another example where there's this, this, this victor's justice coming out of the Cold War, a pretty decent sense of triumphalism married with a sense of American exceptionalism, which I think we see both. We've seen it most most blatantly with the neoconservatives, but I think we've also seen it. Uh, it's it's cross party. It's 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 cross administrations. We see it now with some of the liberal hawks. Where I honestly don't think people really differentiate the Czech Republic, Hungary, um, versus maybe the Baltics, where there are Russian minorities that are larger, particularly you know like Latvia, Estonia, and then Ukraine. It's all kind of just generally one one zone that. This defensive alliance NATO gets to kind of grow up to Russia's doorstep, and there's not a sense of Russia as a singular power with its own interests. And I think you brought up Georgia earlier. I mean, Georgia was an example of you know all this racy talk of you know NATO NATO membership action plans, and we embolden a local leader uh, in a way that we can't ultimately deliver because he then makes miscalculations that of course we don't have any intent defending. And it's really a sense of deja vu seeing this all over again with the you know, Yats and Klitsch and Joe Biden comes out and boy, and again, you know, the cookies and the this. And suddenly you've got this young prime minister in Kiev. I think, what is he, 39, 40 years old? And the country is dissolving. 
there's a schism, which has always existed. What we really should have been doing was trying to create adult supervision with when when Maidan got overly radicalized. And from the Russian vantage point, what you saw was really a coup d'etat. Um, that's the time we should have stepped in and tried. And uh, to some extent, they're our client. And we should have said, look, let's let's. Let's moderate our behavior now. Let's have respect for, for, for Russian interests. And you could say, oh, well, we did that because they were going to repeal that Russian minority language right. You know, there was back in 2012, they passed the right to have Russian language as another secondary language. Mm -hmm. And then one of the first acts of the new government is to repeal that. Imagine the, the yeah. mood. And, and that was that very the important. Right. And so then we, 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 we reverse that through probably some fervent phone calls from Washington to Kiev. But as Putin said in one of his speeches, uh, you know, and I don't have it in front of me, but I think he's basically saying, you know, we noted that and they were holding that in reserve to bring out later. So it just feels like we don't bring a sense of, of situational uh, awareness um, to, 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 to these. There's a great German word. I can't pronounce it. I, I don't I don't speak German, but it, it, it translated it translates as fingertip feeling. Mm -hmm. And. Um, Zalme Kalazad, I think that's you, how you pronounce his name. Mm -hmm. He was our ambassador, I think, to Afghanistan and, mm -hmm. and to Iraq. And um, he, he mentioned at one point that not enough in our diplomatic corps have that, that feeling, that fingertip feeling. And you have to understand, you know, that local train in the Donbass, that local train in the Crimea, how it's, mu it's a much more complicated mosaic and how for the Russians, it's such an existential issue. Mm -hmm. I, I almost wonder if diplomacy is a declining art in the United States. I just noticed that when... Something like this happens, or, or this, or Iran, or any area where, like, doing a reasonable deal seems, at least from my point of view, to be endangered by ideology, right? It seems to me that if you, if you look at the, di the diplomats and ex-diplomats and so on who are, like, speaking sensibly, it's these, you know, like Tom Pickering, it's these guys who are in retirement, basically— and another one's another one's Jack Matloff, by the way. Yeah, well, Matloff Very, had yeah. a piece who he used to be ambassador to Russia. He had a piece in the Washington Post explaining how the last like 15, 20 years have looked from a Russian point of view and how we have consistently not given Russia the kind of minimal respect that it might make strategic sense from our point of view to give them. And and, you know, he was derided as, you know, by by hawks as be you know having drunk the Kool Aid and stuff you know for just conveying the Russian point of view and you're right he's another guy a, kind of an elder statesman in the diplomatic corps and I'm just it's not clear to me I mean when you've got people like Victoria Newland over there I mean not that she's a uh, a diplomat in the sense that they are but a key State Department official. Who, by well, the way, ser served in what's she that? Runs Europe for the State Department. She runs Europe for the State Department. And, yeah, and by the way, I mean, I'm sorry, but what is she doing in the Obama administration? She was in Dick Cheney's foreign policy shop, and I realize that technically that was not an appointed position. But if you look at her kind of ideological pedigree, I don't think it's an accident that she wound up working for Dick Cheney. So I don't like what what does Obama stand for ideologically if he's kind of indiscriminately you know, taking Dick Cheney alumni and giving them influential positions. And of course, she's the one who um, had her, you know, did the famous phone call where she's like, from a Russian point of view, kind of scheming to replace uh, uh, their favored Ukrainian leader. And the guy she designates as the heir apparent indeed becomes the leader. So like, yeah, from Russia's point of view, it looks a little bit like a Western plot, you know. And I don't, I don't understand why she's in the administration. I don't think she's a bad person. She just ideologically does not, I don't think, stand for what I thought when I voted for Barack Obama he stood for. Well, I mean, and, and, I, and I think it goes beyond a specific individual. I think you basically have a whole kind of national security bureaucracy where the players revolve in and out of various administrations. And even with someone as controversial as Dick Cheney, essentially, there's a sense of, as I said, I think it's a sense of groupthink. It's these kind of assumptions around us always being the good guys, not really willing to have uh, a really solid hearing and really digging deep to understand the other side's position. I mean, take, take even, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think I know the guy personally. I'm not sure I've ever met him. We might have had an email exchange when I was blogging Bill Grave Dispatcher. We might not have. But Mike McFall, who was the last ambassador to Russia, from all accounts, he just seems like a really nice, solid guy. He's back at Stanford. But when you look at his ambassadorship to Moscow, mm. he turned he turned Spaso House, which is the, the residence. It, 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 
it's almost as if it was a um, a place for all the and I'm exaggerating a little bit for rhetorical effect, but you know, a place for all the the dissidents to feel welcome and all the social media outreach and the tweeting. It's 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 an it's it's a, it's it's an envoy or plenipotentiary as a as a missionary. Uh, again, this kind of an American exceptionalism and. And that's not really what I think diplomacy is about, especially when you have situations that become so uh, incendiary and fragile and fraught, like the situation we find ourselves today. The job of a diplomat, without without becoming, without delving into clientitis, without parroting back the position of whatever chancellor you've been appointed to, is to understand the positions, relay them back with concrete policy recommendations, with a way towards making. Uh, with, 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 towards conflict resolution, conflict management proactively. And what, look at Ukraine today. We know the basic facts. The country basically has a schism. It's been divided. There's this kind of you know, Orthodox East and Catholic West. All our attention should be focused on having this country, which has not even been independent for a quarter century and was intertwined with Russia for hundreds of years. All of the attention should be focused on how do we Think through some kind of federalization structure where the rights of the Donbass, forget about Crimea at this stage, but the southeastern portions of Ukraine feel that they're respected in a way that diffuses it, gives Putin a face saving element and makes him feel like he has a real counterparty across the table. Instead, what we're doing is we compile these. It, 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 it becomes a competition in posturing. And so what I see the intellectual energy in Washington is I go to state.gov. And I see that the Russians have done something in Crimea and we've issued a fact sheet that tells us all the lies and how Putin is more inventive than Dostoevsky when it comes to fiction. And we kind of, you know, we're all we're all cheery about how we've we've proven that Clint, that, that Putin is such a, a, a such a liar. But what does that accomplish? It what seems, does that accomplish? It seems to me entirely a performance for a domestic audience, so far as I can tell. It's like a demo. It's like a Democrat president worried that he's not considered hawkish enough. You know, he's he's now uh, drawn red lines that weren't red lines and so on. And so he needs to look as tough as possible. And he's going to wind up looking as weak as possible because we keep talking about things that are unacceptable that we're going to wind up accepting. And, and you know, he, he, and, and these sanctions are going to going to ultimately have have no discernible effect on Putin's actual behavior. And uh, so it's just. I, I, I don't know. It just seems to me like, you know, I I don't know. <laughs> and, and Bob, I'm, and Bob, just to say, I mean, you know, he he gave Obama gave a speech in, in Brussels recently. I don't know if it was two, three weeks ago. And I, I read it a little while ago quickly, but it was the usual bromides and kind of kind of the, the transatlantic, you know, the importance of the nation states and NATO and this and that and, you know, the usual feel good. But what I want to say in defense of Obama, just for a moment, is that obviously the alternative, if we had um, a Republican administration in power, where currently at least the chest thumping would be even louder, there'd probably be an even quicker resort to militarism, there'd be an outcry to be arming Kiev. Obama, in his own way, is is at least acting more moderately with this kind of drip feeding of sanctions, which I don't think makes any sense, but the alternative could be even worse. But the problem, and I think almost the, the tragedy with Obama, is he... He has this speech in Brussels. As I said, it's generally an empty, an empty speech. But then he says, look, the door's open for diplomacy. And yet he doesn't execute. He doesn't follow through. The diplomacy is this Geneva statement, which again meant nothing. And so, you know, unless there's something very clever going on behind the scenes right now, which you and I are unaware of, on the back of the Odessa, you know, what's being called the Odessa massacre. Who knows who was responsible, whether the Molotov cocktails were thrown in or thrown out. The bottom line is 40 people died under, at least under very tragic circumstances. And that's going to put real pressure on him. And so it's just a pity that we don't seem to kind of execute and, and, and move forward more robustly in this diplomacy. So what, you know, should he do at this point? I have some thoughts about things I wish he had done at various points, but what, you know, gets the question of like, what will Putin settle for? Leaving aside the question of how much control he has, and clearly things could get beyond his control. Um, but what, what would Putin settle for? So, and, and, and what, by the same token, should we be aiming for and how should we, how should we frame it? Well, I mean, I think, um, I think, it, it's hard to imagine how this type of dialogue could occur given where we're at. But mm -hmm. if Obama could reach out on a personal level 
And this is how this is how great powers are supposed to act. This is you have to you have to help harness the ambitions of what's now become your client because of Miss Newland's cookies and Maidan and all the rest of it. And basically, you know, the notion that Ukraine, forget about Crimea being annexed, but the notion that Ukraine would become part of NATO, I think is just a non-starter from the Russian perspective, unless Ukraine were, were, were really fully divided up to the nice, you know, the, the near, just all the Southeast part. So assuming kind of a ex Crimea unitary Ukraine is still achievable. Um, I think a grown up approach to this would be to say, look, we're going to agree. And we're more importantly, we're going to have Kev agree that Ukraine will never join NATO. It won't be a part of NATO. Um, I think we should allow the door to be open for EU association and ultimately EU membership and, and those types of aspirations of the Ukrainian people. But NATO as the military defensive alliance, certainly not from the Russian perspective, has to be taken off the table. Secondly, I think you have to explore what's being called federalization, which cynics, I think, basically view as soft annexation. But there has to be a face saving to Putin with respect to the Donbass and Southeast Ukraine and how those areas are going to be treated and also kind of a permanent establishment of Russian language rights in those areas. And I think if you could kind of, you know, and then Zvig Brzezinski and others have also talked about the Finland model, and I think Henry Kissinger did as well. And I think the Finland model makes a lot of sense. And so those types of that type of package being put together, um, accompanied also by disarming of groups like the right sector. There has to be comity there. There has to be parity. All the bad guys aren't in Slovansk and Luhansk and Donetsk. They're also bad guys, uh, you know, frankly, with neo-Nazi sympathies uh, in East, in, in Western Ukraine. And so I think you have to kind of think through a package that has all those elements. But I don't see who can negotiate that. I don't see Obama being re having the requisite focus. I see Susan Rice, um, from what I can see on, on Twitter, uh, I don't see any real interagency process that's forging even the semblance of an intelligent policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. I see Secretary of State Kerry as, frankly, as much as, again, on a personal level, he's an accomplished man. He was a senator for many years, a presidential candidate, son of a diplomat. He has it a little bit in his blood. But I don't see him focused in terms of really forging um, serious negotiations with Lavrov. I haven't seen it. Um, and so you just put all that together and you think, OK, well, maybe there are the makings of the deal. But how would it get implemented? Who would implement it? And under what under what auspices? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking as of a couple of weeks ago that what would be nice um, and I, I don't know what you think of this, is if we said, of course, you'd have to get the support of the Kiev government to, to do this, and you might not be able to, but I think... Right, right. Get, but but assuming and you could... And that's not a small... And, and Bob, that's not a small detail. That's not I mean, a small detail. To minimize that. But but the, but what the, what, the, what the politicians in Kiev have to realize is the alternative is that their nation might dissolve. Sure, exactly. That's Those my point. Those are big stakes for them. That's my point. Because what I was yeah. going to say was, as of a couple of weeks ago, it seemed to me, if we if we had said... Look, you're right. You know, self-determination is not a bad thing. So in these eastern provinces, if you wanted to hold elections where, you know, there's like you can vote A, status quo, B, looser, you know, fe federalization, more autonomy within Ukraine, C, joining Russia, you know, spell out something and say, but first, all buildings have to be vacated. All media have to be, you know, all the TV stations that have been seized and whatever. There has to be a free flow of information, blah, blah, blah. It has to have to be international inspectors. Totally has to be totally devoid of a coercive atmosphere. If we can do all that, fine. My reading, based on limited information, is that what would have gotten the most support, you might have had to have kind of runoffs of the two, you know, finalist choices or something, but... Uh, my reading is that what you would have gotten is support for autonomy within Ukraine. Maybe I'm wrong, but in any event, I mean, even in the extreme case of some of the provinces joining Russia, I think there's a real chance that a year from now, we're going to say any of those options would have been better than what's about to happen. And, and you know, it's kind of a face saver for, for both sides in a way. Um, and I again, I think it would have led to a more uh, a looser uh, federalistic Ukraine, probably, but nothing even. Now, there was an offer. The, supposedly, there, there's some offer from the Kievian government having to do with greater autonomy. 
It hasn't gotten that much play. America has not chosen to especially highlight that. And I don't know the details on that. But anyway, that's what I was thinking as of a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, again, and that's the other, you know, all of these local situations are so peculiar and specific to the to the area. So I think deep down, yes, there are some people who probably would prefer union with Russia, but far fewer even in the Donbass than in Crimea. So I think there's there, there's a sense of their own kind of rugged individualism and independence right. and their own desire for autonomy. Um, the problem is, is they're from their vantage point, they're potentially being forced into needing the protection of, of Russia. And I know that sounds like I'm. Um, I'm, I'm reciting Russian propaganda and falling into the hands of that worldview. But it's, you know, right now there are Ukrainian so-called anti-terror operations going on in, in towns in that region where people, and if again, looking at Chivers reporting in the Times, who are not all Russian special forces that have been parachuted in, no. but have their own local ties, are being threatened by the central government of that country. And so, sure, you can take the kind of legalistic norm, you know, Samantha Power sitting in Turtle Bay. What other country would not act this way? Of course, they can go enforce their, their sovereignty. But again, you have to look at what's really going on in the ground. Mm -hmm. These are legitimate grievances. They're, they're, some of them are, are fears that have been whipped up by some propaganda. But a lot of it are legitimate grievances and concerns about, about what a post-Maidan Ukraine would look like. And so we have to deal with that reality. Uh, we, we just do. And 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 right now, what I'm concerned about is that so often one blunders into into wars through a series of miscalculations where there ha people haven't been able to take the temperature down and have a true dialogue. And uh, and I think we're I don't want to say we're on the cusp of that. I, 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 I And it's actually I, I just don't know. I think Putin, despite all the caricatures of him as this kind of Hitlerian figure who's looking for more Lebensraum for the Russians, I think he's actually a very careful tactician and, and indeed strategist. And so he realizes that this is far more complicated than Abkhazia, far right. more complicated than Ossetia, and far more complicated than Crimea, because he can throw all the men across the border tomorrow, but then he has to hold that territory. Right. And he has to deal with all the implications from a financial perspective, which, by the way, I think are a bit overblown. So I still think there's a window of opportunity, Bob, but I just don't know how we can we can leverage that window of opportunity because I don't see the, the diplomacy. Well, recognizing that he is a tactician would be a first step. You know, one thing that has not helped is the kind of Putin is crazy meme. You know, yes. there was a piece in yes. the New Republic by Julia Yaffe some weeks ago. And that's that stuff is just so reflexively nationalistic, naive and unhelpful. I mean, this guy so far has played this whole thing so much more competently than the United States has played pretty much any foreign policy card in the last decade that I can think of that, it, that was this complicated, right? I mean, you can say he's a monster and I believe he's, he's in some sense a bad guy, fine. But to think he's crazy is to so misread him and to so kind of sabotage any serious attempt at resolution. Yeah, I mean, look, he might, he, he, he's corrupt, he's an autocrat. Uh, we can't lionize him. But in terms of taking Crimea, I think almost literally, if not literally, without a shot. Yeah. To your point. Yeah. That was very uh, that was very skillful, um, and he created real facts on the ground that we not, not need to, to to grapple with with respect to that. The issue now is he has to decide. He's got a very complex cost benefit analysis. I think what he's seeing now. There's been also we should talk about this briefly. There's been some speculation about. Joe Biden's visit and John Brennan's visit and were those visits, you know, the timing was coincidental with so, some of these so-called anti-terror operations. Are we whispering in the ear of Kiev to retake control of these southeastern regions? They have a window of opportunity quickly that, you know, maybe Putin will be either caught, you know, flat footed or, or, or behind the eight ball a little bit. Uh, I don't I don't know. None of us know. Um, but I think that type of activity right now, those types of anti-terror operations that are taking place, I think we should be frankly focusing all our intentions on having the Kiev government call them off and de-escalate. Right. Right. And I don't know if we are or not. Well, it seems to me like this is a moment. I think this may well go down as the last moment when we could have said, because I think what happened in Odessa and some of the deaths in eastern Ukraine have led to a kind of a moment of reassessment, probably, on both sides. And I think if at this moment, Obama called Putin and said, OK, let's get serious. We are going to push 
the Kiev government hard to stop all of these anti-terror operations. We would like you to do everything you can to get the pro-Russian forces to cool it. Let's have a serious diplomatic summit and at least see what we can do. Of course, for that to succeed would require, as we've said, almost a shift of worldview within the administration. They'd have to do actual serious diplomacy in the old fashioned sense of the word. But I do sense that this moment right now may be, I think it's a real opportunity and it may be one of the last ones. Maybe I'm over dramatizing it, but I, I don't I don't think you are. I don't think you are. And I actually completely agree with you. I think I think on some level, uh, Putin still craves. He, he's not shallow enough that he needs to be part of the G8 or back from the, you know, the G7 back to G8. But I think he still craves on some level this semblance of respectability in certain circles, despite whatever avenues he's got open with the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians and all the various other countries that he's still you know, dealing with. But I think in terms of the Europe facing, particularly Germany and the U.S., and I think if Obama were able to kind of give him face and talk about serious symmetry, not just having Lavrov and Kerry you know, having to, you know, have their meeting and then huddle in the back room with instructions from Moscow that are basically creating a document, which means nothing, but really having a serious conversation on some of the fundamental issues we were talking about, that could provide a window. But honestly, Bob, I just don't see it happening, um, given all the, all the issues we talked about. And so if it doesn't happen, I mean, the question is what happens? Uh, because the situation is not nearly as clean from Putin's point of view as Crimea was. On, on the one hand, he's going to want something in eastern Ukraine. At a minimum, I think some kind of uh, a relative greater autonomy for those uh, uh, some of those eastern provinces. He's going to want something, but it's not this relatively neat situation in Crimea where he can send in some little green men and it's done, right? Because as you said, although he has considerable support in the east, it's not as overwhelming as in Crimea. And I don't even know where the how the geography works in terms of where are the likely stopping points, you know, where are the where are the kind of firm borders that he would not even think of uh, wanting to go beyond. So, you know, what does he now? <coughs> will he have to send in actual troops or does he think uh, he can get it done without an overt invasion? I mean, where do you see this? Assuming that, that the administration doesn't try to seize this moment, where do you see this uh, heading? Well, I mean, I think uh, putting aside wild kind of maximalist uh, scenarios where it was really just, you know, marching into Kiev kind of stuff, which I don't think is, is, is just massively remote on the probability curve. Yeah. I think the most aggressive actions that Putin could take would essentially be flooding Russian troops across the border on the basis that peacekeepers are required because the, the, the communities have become besieged by these so-called anti-terrorist uh, groups and essentially because Kiev has not honored the Geneva Agreement per their vantage point. And the question then becomes, once those peacekeepers stroke troops are flooded in, where do they go and where do they stop? Um, I'm not a, a particular Ukraine expert in terms of the specific, you know, um, each specific province. But I think the Donbass uh, would be kind of no brainer fair in terms of where those troops would flood in. But I think then the question becomes, would he then decide to move kind of sync up with trans Dniester and Odessa, given what happened in Odessa and have a land corridor that covers all the way there? That is something that I think he would potentially do. I think that ups the ante even more than just more of a Dunbass maneuver, though that would obviously be very significant as well. But I think these are the types of options he's probably already actively considering because I think the situation is that grave. Mm -hmm. Now, all that being said, and I, I was looking at something before we chatted, but as recently as uh, I, he had some answers to a journalist as, as recently as April 29th, where he was already saying, you know, can the situation be resolved? It probably can, but this would require the parties to the conflict to sit down at the negotiating table and respect the Geneva agreements. This would mean that the authorities in Kiev would have to release from prison the people in whom Ukrainians have placed their trust and chosen as leaders and would have to begin direct dialogue with these people. It would mean disarming the radicals, right sector, other radical groups, clearing them out of buildings in Kiev, et cetera, et cetera. So as recently as a few days ago, he is also seemingly holding the door open for diplomacy, but because that degree of serious, robust dialogue doesn't seem to be occurring, and because people are dying uh, and asking for his protection, uh, it just increases the chances every day that we stumble into a hot war. Yeah, and the thing you alluded to, the Southern Corridor, has got to be at some level attractive for him because uh, he currently lacks land access to Crimea, which is which he now owns, right? And so you can see the appeal of a continuous swath of land uh, all the way to that like obscure little 
sliver in technically in Moldova that he already effectively controls, right? Uh, that that right. would uh, this would cover Odessa. It would give him direct access. It, it would then then Crimea would become part of a continuous Russian landmass. So I've got to think that although again he's not crazy. Uh, and 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 uh, I actually think he's even in a weird way reasonably risk averse. As as odd as that may sound to Western ears, he doesn't often do like, like, like crazy, out of the box stuff. You know, Georgia no. was totally under control what he did in Georgia, and um, so although you know, uh, I, I've got to think that that is appealing, and it just seems to me, the more out of control it gets, uh, you know the more that's got to be on his radar screen because he's starting to think, yeah, we're going to have to send troops in. Well, why not, from his point of view, create the optimal, you know, kind of uh, arrangement in terms of land mass? Yeah, I mean, I think the issue with that is that I think in his his cost benefit analysis, that materially ups the ante in terms of it, even the Italians and the Spanish. And, you know, we've seen this movie so many times before where supposedly there's a unified stance on kind of robust, heavy sanctions. And then when it comes time to really kind of get to the nitty gritty, certain parties start peeling away. I think if you had a situation like that, where he basically took this whole kind of Southern Carter option, not only Angela Merkel, the Brits and the US, but probably even the Italians and the Spaniards, you'd have a very united, at least first round query, how effective those sanctions would be and query the blowback. But uh, you'd have the so-called sectoral sanctions, which people have been talking about uh, for a while. I think what's probably more likely if the situation continues to deteriorate is localized actions where what he does do is he he unequivocally does send Russian forces across the border. There's no more of this mass grade or are there little green men or not little green men or who's there or who's that or where. He actually sends Russian forces across. They're called peacekeepers in this equation to certain areas like Slavansk and these these towns where there have been. Uh, these incidents and he starts there and he continues to increase his leverage asking for real bargaining across the table and when it probably continues not to happen he then you know in a more incremental fashion uh figures out how far he wants to go right that's probably maybe a little more likely yeah well i i, I have no hope that the administration is going to do what i really think they should at this point um which is get serious about a a, a summit um but is there anything uh, anything else on Ukraine? I may ask you one question about Asia, as long as you're in Asia. But is there uh, anything else you 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 want to say on on the subject of Ukraine? No, I mean I think uh, I think we covered uh, you know kind of the current situation and and uh, I think the next 48, 72 hours. I mean you know the, the other thing of course are the elections uh, coming up May twenty fifth and. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I haven't really, frankly, given that much thought to Putin's specific tactics or strategy vis-a-vis -vis the impending elections. But I would assume what he's going to say is, how can you have elections under the circumstances mm -hmm. that have countries mm -hmm. under the gun of anti, um, anti-terror operations? Right. Maybe a bit hyperbolic. But so I think that's another timing factor that's part of the overall the party's calculation right now. So we probably, in a way, unless there are more incidents like Odessa, we probably have a window of, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks going into these elections that still give some room for more for more significant diplomacy. That's probably the last well, the last thing. So well, better hurry, because if you, you know, if you ask, well, how did Odessa happen? Well, had something to do with like, you know, soccer fans who presumably had been drinking or something. I mean, those kinds of things are going to happen. Just all of these kinds of things are just more likely, you know, to happen as time goes on. So um, yeah. on you know, you're in Asia, you're observing the situation in China. Uh, do you have any observations about U.S. dealings with China that may or may not be related to U.S. dealings with Russia? Obviously, there's some similarity. Uh, these are, well, one is a rising great power and one is a not rising great power, but a significant power. Both of them claim spheres of influence. In the case of China, this is manifest with uh, currently with these disputes over islands and so on. Um, Obama just went there and reassured people that, you know, we're, uh, we're behind them, you know, Japan and so on. What, what's your what's your take on how we're approaching Asia? Well, you know, I'd say I'd say on Obama's trip to, to China and this, so, you know, or Obama's trip to Asia, he did not go to China, which which I'll come back to on the so-called pivot or rebalancing or whatever you want to call me. Put yourself I mean, in the past couple of months. There was a horrific terrorist attack in a train station in China with these knife wielding um, separatists. Um, 
there was this Malaysian flight which disappeared, which I take it CNN is run, which I don't watch, but I take it they've been running that nonstop. But the point is you had a very large number of PRC fatalities. Imagine if there had been a massacre in a significant American city at a train station with knife-wielding marauders, and then a large commercial flight going to, I don't know, somewhere in uh, you know, Mexico, Cancun or something, uh, had disappeared, and you had very significant loss. Imagine just the, 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 the media firestorm and the obsession and the navel-gazing within the U.S. So now, the China, I'm not, just, just put that as a scene setter. Then he comes out and he basically visits, you know, the Philippines and of course Japan on the island issue and 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 Malaysia and doesn't doesn't visit doesn't visit the PRC. Uh, Michelle Obama and her children had been to China uh, a little bit before, um, but to me it 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 registers again as a it's more of a containment move. I think from Beijing's perspective, they they cannot help seeing this as a containment posture vis-a-vis -vis China. And again, you know, these islands, and, and, and we could talk about, we could talk about, you know, even the NATO tripwire in Narva, but I still query whether the United States would expend full bore blood and treasure to defend these disputed islands between Japan and China, or even Taiwan for that matter. So putting that aside specifically, it just gets back to the broader point of making commitments and pursuing policy on premises that I'm not sure we have ultimately thought through the implications, and we don't have due regard or respect for the other side's view of it uh, and the other narrative, the other the, the, the other side's narrative of it. And so I feel that we're a bit clumsy, and we traipse too arrogantly, and we don't listen enough, and that's how these types of miscalculations and in the, in these incendiary uh, situations occur. All right. You know, I... Uh... I wish there were these island dispute things, ter all these territorial disputes, it would be nice, and there may be such a thing, it would be nice if there was some international body that you could, <laughs> you know, just the way you can now use the World Trade Organization ever since it became an actual adjudicatory body, right? Now you can just push those trade disputes over to the WTO and say, let us know when you finish with, with your ruling a couple of years from now, and then you will authorize some uh, token sanction from by one side or the other, but that kind of takes the domestic political pressure off the actors, right? Because okay, we you know WTO is looking into it. It would be it seems to me in general it should have been a U.S. priority for a couple of decades now to try to see to it that more and more disputes in general are resolved through some sort of systematic means uh, in accordance with international law. But I'm not like aware of some body that you could. You could send these things to, or at least propose that they be sent to. But that, that's what I'd like to see. Well, I mean, look, to defend again the U.S. on this, I mean, what they talk about, and I don't have the exact verbiage, but trying to make China a more constructive partner within kind of international fora. And you could see Obama and everyone in the administration making the right noises about wanting to have those types of conflict resolution mechanisms. But the reality, again, is I, I don't think the Chinese are at a stage where they would accept that, to be very frank, Bob. I think just like we have to remember the dissolution of the Cold War, the Soviet empire crumbling, NATO encirclement from the perspective of Moscow, we have to think through, you know, Chinese history and the gross humiliation of the last century and all the turmoil they've been through, but the, the, the humiliations at the hand of the West and how they're rising. This is not, you know, there could be macro bumps on the road. Uh, you know, clearly China has some real economic issues, but the secular trend is incredibly compelling about the economic growth going on there. Does it mean that they're going to replace the United States as some kind of, you know, significant, you know, global hegemon? Mm -hmm. But the Chinese, um, the Chinese are, are, are taking their, their seat at the table, uh, and especially with respect to their immediate neighborhood. And again, why wouldn't we be more understanding uh, of that? Uh, and uh, I think we would say it's because we're actually looking to preserve the security architecture in this region, and we're trying to control miscalculations by various sides to keep the peace, which is noble and laudable. But the problem is if you if you go too far in one direction, you could create miscalculations from the Chinese side. So um, I, 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 if I had been Obama, and even in the context that the whole point of the trip was to reassure everyone that there really is a pivot, I would have probably still gone to Beijing in the context that they've been, you know, that there have been these significant events that just happened and, and make it look like he's traveling to Asia to kind of rebalance and repivot with everyone. Sure. You know, 
Sure. Why not go to China? I don't. I don't get that. Yeah. Why, why? Why energize the anti-American narrative that that already has kind of taken root there? Um, and 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 Bob, I think I think the reason is he he canceled the summit last year. I forget. It might have been some congressional deadlock, which in itself is very evocative of our own issues. You know, yeah. we haven't talked about it today, but executing foreign policy in this right. in this you know with the Hill and everything else. But he had to. He had to cancel his last trip, and I think probably his advisor said, you have to focus on going to Kuala Lumpur and Manila and Tokyo and, and, and Seoul and just reassuring everyone that we're really still in, in the theater and we've got their back, to right. use verbiage that, that he likes. But that's not doesn't necessarily mean that was the right decision. No, no. Uh, and also in his defense, oh, I'm going to have to go because my dog is demanding to be let out, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, in Obama's defense, I mean, it's a little awkward. Japan is clearly an ally. They are currently administering these islands. It it looks pretty damn awkward if we let, you know, these islands that they are administering, whatever the history of the islands and however uh, ambiguous the actual ownership may be, looks pretty bad if, like, China snatches them and we don't, you know. But uh, but anyway, the... Uh, um, to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. And thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I, I wish, you know, I, I wish you, uh, I nominate you to replace Victoria Newland. I don't, I don't think that'll, uh, I don't think that'll get the job done it itself, but maybe we'll start a grassroots movement for that. I, I'd like to see your perspective carry more sway, but thanks so much, Greg. It was, it was great chatting, Bob. I appreciate the time. Have a great Sunday and, uh, we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, let's do this again. All, All right. right. Good take, take thank care. you.